Welcome to What's New with Office 365. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global. I'm glad to be your host for today's event. We'll also be joined today by, Ready Talk, I'm sorry, by Tech Impact's two staff people that we're happy to have on the line. They'll be our experts on Office 365, and they are true experts in both the rollout and implementation and maintenance of Office 365, where they do it with Tech Impact and their nonprofit community and helping organizations install and roll it out on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll first mention Sam Chenkin, who's going to be our primary speaker today, who is the direction, Director of Solution Development for Tech Impact, a Philadelphia-based nonprofit that provides tech support and cloud services to nonprofits, charities, and NGOs around the world. He has worked with nonprofits for his entire career, and I should mention Tech Impact is also a nonprofit like TechSoup. His passion is designing and implementing technology rooted in context, ensuring that it is meeting the real-world goals and challenges of the organizations he supports. So we're glad to have him on the line. We'll also be joined by Linda Widdop, who will mostly be on the back end helping answer your questions throughout the webinar. And she is the Director of Technology Services at Tech Impact, managing all aspects of client relations, including providing nonprofits with project plans and budget development, implementation oversight, and resource allocation for their projects. So we're happy to have her joining us. They have years of experience and do this, like I said, every day helping other nonprofits with their Office 365 rollouts in addition to a whole host of other services. So we're lucky to have them joining us. You'll see on the back end Kevin Lowe, who is a staff person here at TechSoup, and he'll be there to grab your questions and help you with any technical issues. TechSoup's headquarters is here in San Francisco. Today I'm actually joining you from the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. And we have Sam and Linda, I believe, in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, someplace around there. So go ahead and chat in to let us know where you're joining from. And while you do that, I'll do a quick overview of our agenda. I'll start out with an introduction of both TechSoup, and then Linda will join us to do a quick introduction of Tech Impact. We'll have a couple of poll questions to get an idea of where you, our audience, has experience already with Office 365. And then we'll bring Sam on the line to cover some important information and talk about some of what's new with Office 365. If you haven't participated in an Office 365 webinar before, or if you aren't familiar with the product already, this is not intended to be a brand new introduction to it. A couple of weeks back we held a webinar called What is Office 365? And we linked to that on that registration page. That's actually an ideal webinar if you are brand new to it. So today we're going to be talking about things that may be a little bit more uh, complex, maybe a little bit uh, deeper or higher level. Uh, we're not going to be walking through the nuts and bolts of what each uh, part of Office 365 does because we have covered that before. So if that's new to you, this may not be the right event for you, but you're welcome to stay with us either way. Everybody's welcome, but we want to make sure that you know that there are other resources, the webinar from a couple of weeks ago, as well as a host of other events that we've done on Office 365 in the past. So to introduce us, uh, TechSoup Global is a nonprofit network of 63 partner NGOs worldwide, serving nonprofits in 120 plus countries around the world. We do that by delivering nonprofit uh, technology resources, support, donations, uh, and things like Office 365 to the nonprofit sector. And you can see that we do that all around the world where all those dots are located. And so far we've served more than 615,000 615, NGOs around the world. And we've delivered donations of technology products, resources, and grants to nearly a tune of $5 billion throughout the sector around the world. And we're proud to have done that. I, prior to being a staff person here, worked for three small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Open California where I was a beneficiary of many of those donations. So I'm happy to be part of the staff in helping deliver these kinds of trainings to you. You can learn more about our product donation programs at TechSoup.org. And I'll show where to access the Office 365 donations for those of you who haven't actually begun an implementation and think you might want to in just a couple of moments. But before I do that, I'd like to bring on Linda Widdop to give us a little bit of an introduction of what Tech Impact does and their work. So welcome to the line, Linda. We're glad to have you on. Thanks, Becky. 
Um, as Becky mentioned, my name is Linda Whitup. I'm the Director of Technology Services. Uh, we are located, our main office is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I see a lot of people chatting out uh, their locations and some people saying hot, hot North Carolina. Um, we actually cooled down a bit yesterday, so that was nice. Um, you, you'll meet Sam Schenken in a minute, but I wanted to go real quickly over Tech Impact and what we do. So Becky mentioned that we are also a nonprofit. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization started in um, 2002 to deliver implementation services to other nonprofits. Um, since in our 12 years, we've grown from um, serving just the Philadelphia region to serving nonprofits across the country and across the globe. Our mission is to ensure that all nonprofits can use technology to better serve our world. So we are trying to look at big picture, which is a lot of what Sam does, and also um, help with the day-to-day -day tasks of, I can't print, and what kind of email should I use? Um, so we do, uh, we do a lot of work with managed IT services. So we are a help desk. We provide help desk services to over 100 nonprofits across the country. Um, we also do office, a lot of Office 365 assessment and implementation work, which is why we're asked to provide content like this on webinars for um, TechSoup and Microsoft and all kinds of places. Uh, we also do data management, so we do cloud backup services. We also look at helping organizations deal with data on a daily basis, so what database should I use? How can I get that report to run? How about system integration? We work a lot with that as well. Um, and then finally, we do a voice over IP phone system, where, which we resell to nonprofits at a, at a very low cost. Um, so if you're looking for that kind of stuff, please feel free to contact me. Uh, hold on a minute. We uh, so the next slide you'll see is our reach across the country, just to give you a little bit of context of where we work. And we've also done some work across the pond, as they say, in Europe, um, India, and um, a couple of different places. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sam so that he can get the content started. Are you on next? Great. Well, actually, I'm going to jump back oh, in no, here, sorry. Linda. Thanks for that. No problem. So folks are already clicking on this survey, which is great. And we asked your organization size here because size matters when it comes to Office 365 implementation and rollout. And based on how big your organization is or how small it is can depend on the best tasks and methods for you to use to to implement Office 365. And even though we're going to be talking about some of the what's new today, some of the what's new may be much more relevant to your organization if you have 100 people or if you have 50 people versus if you have two or three. It might not be worth your time and effort. So we'll be talking about some of that. I have one other poll question, so let's wait just a couple more seconds for everybody to participate. Right now we have 165 or so people in the room. And we'll capture that quickly. And then I'll talk about where you can get Office 365 before turning over to Sam. And while people are still answering the question on the screen, Linda mentioned some of Tech Impact services. And toward the end of the webinar, I'll just briefly show where you can access some of the, the either heavily discounted donated services that they provide through TechSoup's catalog as well. So let me go ahead and click on to the next one. It looks like most people participated in this. And I'm just going to show quickly that we have quite a big number of organizations that are 1 to 5 or 6 to 20 staff. That's about half of our audience. And we have actually quite a lot of organizations that are pretty large too. So that's great to know kind of where the span is in today's webinar. The next question I'm going to ask is just about what features you've already implemented in Office 365. And this is assuming that you may have implemented some parts of it. Maybe you have started using file storage, or maybe you started your email, maybe you have used Yammer, or you're using Skype for Business, which used to be called Link. Uh, maybe you're using the free Office web apps or something else. So let us know in chat where you're at currently 
with any Office 365 implementation. And again, this is just to get an idea. Somebody's commenting in chat that they just signed up for the donation yesterday. So maybe that's your situation and you have requested seats and you just don't know where to go next or you haven't started yet. So this is helpful. You can select more than one thing on that option list. So go ahead and do that. And again, this helps inform our presenters uh, as to where our audience is really at in their own process of moving to Office 365. And I'm going to go ahead and show the results so we can move forward. It looks like almost 60% have not implemented any so far. So like I said, a number of people have commented that they've requested seats in the donation that's available from Microsoft, but they haven't actually done anything with it yet. Uh, and then it looks like the majority of those who have started have started with email followed by using Office Web Apps, which you can do without actually requesting Office 365. So to move us forward quickly, I just want to go ahead and talk about the donated licensing options. If you're on TechSoup's website and you search for Office 365 or you just go TechSoup.org slash Office 365, you will come to this page and it's Microsoft's um, product page that talks about their donation and gives some details in the description and how to get it, the rules and eligibility. If you're currently in TechSoup's database and you're eligible for Microsoft donations, then you're eligible for Office 365. You can click to get it now. And it doesn't take you to one of TechSoup's pages because we don't actually fulfill this donation. Microsoft does. It takes you to this page where then you can scroll to the bottom. This is Microsoft's Corporate Citizenships page. They actually fulfill the donation directly and you get to select one of these four options. And we really look at the E1 and the E3 options were what were available last year. Uh, and now they've expanded it to a business premium and a business essentials option too. Most folks are still looking at the E1 and the E3. Some are looking at the, the business premium as well. Um, and the E1 is a full donation. You can access that for no cost for your organization if you're an eligible nonprofit. It is a full donation. The difference between these ones is that it doesn't include a full installed office operating system, or not operating system, Office Productivity Suite. So if you're, this gives you access to it with using just those web apps of Word and Excel and PowerPoint. If you need full installed Office Suite, then you can rent it essentially with the $2 per user per month fee or $4.50 per user per month fee. Or you can purchase, I'm putting that in scare quotes, you can purchase licenses through TechSoup's donation program with Microsoft. And those are perpetual licenses where you pay one time, you get it. They come with software assurance. You can upgrade those for free for no additional cost within two years. So anytime there's a new upgrade for a new version of Office, you can upgrade for free through that. So many organizations do that, but there are limits because you can only get up to 50 licenses of the Office suite through the Microsoft donation program with TechSoup. Or TechSoup. So if you need more than 50, you may want to get those 50 through our donation program and then subscribe to one of these monthly per user per month uh, you know, options through the Microsoft donation program of Office 365. I'm not going to spend more time on that now. Did you want to weigh in, Linda? Yep. Go yeah, ahead. can I just jump I just want to jump in and clarify one thing about the nonprofit E1 donation. Once you get the E1 donation, you can add the Office 2013 Professional Plus Suite subscription for $2 per user per month. So there is kind of an in-between option for nonprofits that we would be happy to talk about at another time. Right, and that is here on the screen too. So it's either the $2 per user per month or the $4.50 per user per month to now, add that on. Now, this is something different. The E1 you can add for $2 per user per month. It's not on Microsoft's website. It's on the Oh, website. okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So once you're in the licensing console, it will show up as an option. So that's kind of a, a thing that, yeah, it is a little bit confusing. So just wanted to throw that out there for folks who might want to have that as an option and not have to go with the 450 That's great to know. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate right. the clarification because I was conflating the two. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have Sam take over. We're a little bit off on time, so I want him to be able to move forward, and I'll work on answering any questions that came in the chat. 
directly in the chat. So Sam, thank you. Welcome to the program. Talk to us a bit about some important considerations and things that are happening and tell us what's new with Office 365. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. Uh, okay. So uh, we're going to talk today about some of what's new in Office 365. This is going to be of limited use to people who have not already implemented any piece of Office 365. Um, but uh, hopefully for some of you, you'll get to see some of the things you might be able to do once you do a basic implementation. Um, and of course, we do have uh, webinars on TechSoup with a demo, and we do a demo every other week of Office 365 on our website, techimpact.org, if you want to learn more about what Office 365 is. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, some important information. We're also going to cover what's new in Office 365. Um, and so I want to start with just a little bit of information about how updates and new features get added to Office 365 and where you can go to find information about what's coming up and what's already been implemented. So Office 365 is the, the same tools that you can install on a server. So you can go to TechSoup and you can find Exchange Server. And you can purchase Server 2012 and you can install that on a physical machine on your network. Or you can go to Office 365 and you can get the same services donated from Microsoft where they're hosting them. Right? So your data is still in the same Microsoft products, but Microsoft is managing the whole thing for you. They're making sure that everything works together. Um, so your data is in um, at least three data centers um, you know, in the continental uh, U.S., and it's in at least three servers in each of those data centers. And if an entire data center drops off the map, uh, you, have, um, you, you can lose up to five minutes worth of data. That's the maximum sync time when you send an email or you make a change to a file or something like that. And that's if an entire data center disappears, which has not happened. Um, Microsoft is making new features available first to Office 365 subscribers. So when they create a new feature, that feature becomes available to you in Office 365. And then they roll that out to on-premise software after the fact. Uh, so being in Office 365 is the way to get access to a lot of technologies that, uh, that you wouldn't be able to get access to uh, first. Um, and one of the downsides of this is that sometimes things just kind of turn on. Right? So it is important if you're in Office 365 to pay at least a little bit of attention to what is changing and what's coming up since you know, that will just be pushed out to you in most cases without you, um, being, uh, you know, being in control of whether or not it happens. So there's some great resources that you can use to understand what's going on here. If we take a look here on the roadmap, this is a website. And when you get these slides, these are all hyperlinked. So you will actually get a link to this website. But the roadmap tells you all the features that are coming up on Office 365. So you can see features that are rolling out, and you can see features that are in development, and features that are launched. And if you click on them, you, know, you can expand each of these sections, and you can get a really good idea of, of what's coming up. This is a great place to keep an eye on. Uh, another place that I know um, that I look pretty extensively, which didn't make it into these slides, but I will certainly include that in the follow-up slides. There's also a blog um, that Microsoft provides where they post updates about things that are coming up on Office 365 relatively frequently. So I follow that blog, and that's how I'm aware of new things that are happening. You do have some limited control over new features in Office 365. In Office 365, if you log into the Admin Center, you go to Service Settings and then Updates, you can turn on or off first release versus standard release. So features first become available to organizations that have opted in to first release. So here you can say, see that we've opted in to our entire organization getting releases first. So whenever a new feature is available, maybe before it's entirely ready for prime time, we get access to it so that we can tell our clients about it. You may stay in the standard release cycle, so you will get them less often um, and once they've been vetted a little bit more thoroughly. You can also request those features just for a few individuals. So if you want to have access to those features but you don't want all your staff to because they might panic, that's something you can do directly from within this screen. SharePoint itself also has um, functionality to enable or disable preview features. So this is the second place that you may need to go. And here you can control within SharePoint whether or not your users have access to preview features. Okay, so that's about it for the architecture. Um, I want to show you this slide. This is the drop-down menu. If you haven't seen Office 365 recently, this is the app menu where you can go to see all the different services that are available to you. Uh, we probably have a few more tools than you might have access to, partially because of the first release, like Sway, 
here, and partially um, because we um, have some additional licenses that you may not be using for CRM and Project and Power BI and some other things. But you can see here there are so many apps that are included as part of Office 365, and it can be a little bit overwhelming to keep up. So I, again, I would encourage you to take a look at that roadmap and to take a look um, at uh, controlling whether or not you are getting access to those early features. Okay, so uh, that's sort of setting the um, setting a framework here, and now I'd love to step into what is actually new inside of Office 365. I'm going to take a pause after each new feature and uh, have an opportunity here for people to ask questions. So if you do have any questions when we when we finish covering a certain topic, please type them into the chat window and those that we think would be useful for the whole group to hear, um, we'll we'll answer publicly. Okay, one of the biggest changes, something you've probably heard about recently, is Link is now Skype for Business. So it used to be Link Online, and now it is Skype for Business. Um, and this is the new Skype for Business client. If you have not received, if you're already using Link, you would probably have been upgraded to Skype for Business. That probably just happened. And that's something you would have known about um, if you took a look at the roadmap and the blog. It's kind of annoying, but, but there it is. Um, there are some great things here. So, so one thing to keep in mind is that Skype for Business is still Link. Okay, so it's named Skype, but it is not Skype. It is Skype for Business. Okay? And it is a separate client from the Skype client. So you can still go to Skype.com, which is owned by Microsoft, and you can download the Skype for Desktop client. But that Skype for Desktop client will not allow you to log in to your Skype for Business account. Okay? So it's still a separate client. Um, and there are um, the, the features that are available in Skype are not necessarily available in Skype for Business. So for instance, you can't make phone calls to phone lines, and you can't receive calls from phone lines. Okay, so calling a regular phone number is not something that you can do with Skype for Business, even though it has Skype in the name. That is probably something that is coming in the next year or two, but it is not available yet. Um, it is possible to pay for a connected conference bridge, so like we're doing with ReadyTalk. Some of you are in the audio via the app, and some of you are in the audio via dial-in number. You can set that up with Skype for Business or with Link, uh, but you do need to pay for that. That's a separate service, and it's not free. Um, I do want to point out that with Link, you could talk to Skype for Business contacts, but only if they, um, only if they had I'm sorry, you, from, from Link you could talk to Skype users, but only if those Skype users had a new Microsoft account set up. With the new version of, with the new version of uh, Skype for Business, you can actually talk directly to Skype contacts um, from within Skype for Business. You do, however, have to enable it. So you can see here in the admin portion of Skype for Business, you can um, turn on public IM connectivity. There's a checkbox there. And in Skype, if you want to be able to be seen by people who are using Skype for Business, you have to allow IMs from anyone. So I want to point that out. So um, this, this is a feature that's now available with Skype for Business. Any questions about Skype for Business that we think would be useful for the whole group? Becky, I don't know if anything's come through. Sorry, Sam. Yep, we do have one question that was asked. Um, oh, you know what, actually I think it might have just been answered in the chat. I think we can keep on going. Thanks. Great. Okay, so let's continue and talk about Delve. Uh, Delve is a brand new feature that's part of Office 365. Um, I guess it's been around for about a year, but it's just recently become useful. Um, and it is a place that you can go to see what people are working on um, and what you are working on. So if we take a look here, um, it's a place to see information about your coworker or yourself. You can see recently accessed files that you edited files you sent or received in an email, files you might be interested in. So it's, it's kind of doing a guess. right? Um, so you can see here in our screenshot, we are looking at Gabe, and we can see his recent activities, and we can also see his recent profile, and we can um, see what he's working on. I could also look at myself and see the same information. Uh, Delve is security-based, so you can only see what you have access to. When we're actually viewing a file inside of Dell, we can easily take action on it. We can edit it. We can see who has access to it if we're worried about security. We can um, email or post it to Yammer. So again, this is sort of one place where we can go to take a look at what's trending in our organization, what's being used. And we can also create boards with Dell. And when we create a board, we can add files to that board, and those um, become publicly visible. So if we have a project that we're working on, or maybe if we have uh, some HR documents that we want everyone to be able to find really easily. 
Um, you know, those documents can be stored in SharePoint, but we can make them really easily accessible using a board inside of Microsoft Delft. And again, this is accessible just from the app menu at the top of Office 365. Um, and that's a short introduction to Delve. Uh, Becky, do we have any questions about Delve, Delve that would be helpful for the whole group to hear? Nothing about Delve. Um, I do actually have one question that came up about Skype. If you don't mind jumping back to Skype to business or for business for just a second, um, Terry asked, "Can the admin set to allow IMs from anyone from within the whole organization with the permissions in Skype for Business, or how does that work with permission setting?" You are trying. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? They're asking if an admin can set whether you receive Skype messages from anybody across the whole organization or if you could limit that or how if there's any admin control over who can Skype and IM with one another. Uh, you cannot limit that from within Office 365, although you could control who had a Skype for Business license and just not give them a license. You can okay. allow you can talk to other Skype for Business users that are in other organizations and you can control which other organizations you can communicate with, but within an organization that can't be limited. Great. And we did just have another question, a question come in about Delve actually. Rob asks, how does Delve differ from Team Sites? Is it essentially just more concise? Yeah, it's pulling information in from Team Sites. So the data is still stored in Team Sites or in your OneDrive um, or as attachments in your email. Delve is one place to go to sort of see what you're working on and what's trending across the organization. So it's, it's a different view of the same data. Great. I think that's it. And we are working hard at the back end to try and answer questions as they come in as well. So feel free to ask them as they come to you. Even if we don't ask them live on the line with Sam, we'll be trying to plow through them directly one-on-one -on, -one on the back end. Okay. Um, Great. So Thanks, Sam. Let's, let's uh, power through. So here is Azure Video. So Azure Video is another feature that's accessible now. Um, this is an early release feature of Office 365. I want to point out that with most of these features, you need to be on an e-plan in order to use them. So the P plan is limited in what you have access to, and so you really do need to be on an E plan to take advantage of a lot of what Office 365 has to offer. And since there really is no compelling reason to be on the P plan, since you can get the same functionality just with that E1 license plus the, the $2 per user per month for the Office Pro Plus license, um, I, I would encourage everyone to make sure that they sign up for E1 or E3 plans as opposed to the professional plan. So Azure Video um, is a place that we can go to store internal videos that are going to be used by my organization. So we can use this to store you know, videos of events that we might want to use for marketing purposes. We can use it to store um, videos that we might want to use for training. Um, we can use it to store any kind of internal video. So again, this is sort of like a private YouTube. Within Azure Video, we are organizing content into channels, and each channel can have different permissions about owners, editors, and viewers. Okay, so the videos are actually stored in SharePoint Online. Okay, so that does count towards your storage usage. But they're transcoded in something called Azure Media Services. So you can upload a video in pretty much any format, and it's going to automatically manage converting that to a format that you can view you know, on your smartphone or in the web browser. Um, this is a preview feature, so it's, it's not necessarily ready for, uh, for prime time, but it might be something you want to take a look at. Um, so one of the things is that playback is, is flash based. So you need to set flash player um, to use it. Um, and, and that I'm sure is going to change very soon. There's also limited customization. So in the future I would expect that we'll be able to add tags to videos, um, add um, managed metadata to videos. Um, but right now um, really we're, we're limited to just sort of a name and a description for every video. And then the storage is still in SharePoint Online, which obviously does have a cost associated with it, although it is relatively inexpensive. Um, and that's it for Azure Video. Um, Becky, any questions that came in about Azure Video or anything we talked about so far? Um, not specifically about that. Nope. So we can go ahead and move forward. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm going to dive into compliance within Office 365. We're actually going to talk about a lot of different features in Office 365 that are recent or new or coming um, that allow nonprofits to stay in compliance with PCI and HIPAA and all those other things. Um, so this is a big part um, of what I wanted to talk about today. Inside of Office 365, there are a number of tools that we're going to mention. There's a new Compliance Center 
And we're going to talk about retention and legal hold and DLP um, and some SharePoint tools as well. This is the new Compliance Center inside of Office 365. Uh, you can see we can go to one place um, and we can control um, our, our data loss prevention, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. We can create cases where we can control, um, where we can automatically search centrally for content, um, and we can, um, we can set up anything related to compliance in Office 365 in one place. Uh, so let's start here. Let's talk about retention a little bit. So retention is a tool that allows us to control what, uh, what happens to email after a certain age. So we can control whether or not we're, we're deleting or archiving or moving mail that is older than a week or a month. Um, and this is server side. So it's kind of like auto archive and outlook except that everything happens on the server rather than being within your, um, being within your actual Outlook client. Um, next up, uh, the retention is actually well, it's been a, uh, it's a feature that's been around for a while, but uh, it is something that sort of ties into everything else that Office 365 offers. Another tool is Legal Hold. So Legal Hold is a feature that requires either an E3 license or a $1 per user per month add-on to an E1 license. And with it, you can uh, determine whether or not email that is deleted or modified or calendar appointments that are deleted or modified get sort of held in the back end. So if you want to be able to go back and say, oh yes, we definitely received this email or we definitely sent this email and no, no one deleted this email um, or edited this email, you can do that using legal hold and you can indicate mailboxes or parts of mailboxes that should be protected. Um, okay, the next tool that I want to talk about um, as part of Exchange, this is a new tool. It's called Data Loss Prevention. We can set up rules in Office 365 that allow us to scan email for privileged content. So uh, if, if you have um, PII that you're worried about, if you're worried about someone sending a Social Security number or a credit card or even like a home address or a driver's license number, you can set up rules that are going to detect when that content is in an email. And you can take action on that. So if that email is being sent outside of the organization, you could automatically encrypt that email. Um, or you could uh, prevent a user from displaying that email, or you could notify their manager that they're sending that email. So if you are working in uh, a compliance-based organization where you need to track this stuff, you need to make sure that people are following your policies, DLP or data loss prevention is a great way to do that. And this does require an E3 license inside of Office 365. And the last exchange tool I want to talk about this um, is just auditing tools. These are turned on by default for the most part. So you can go into Office 365 and you can run reports. So if you're worried that someone went in and did something that they shouldn't do, you can go in and you can take a look um, for permission changes, wondering if someone changed permissions to access another person's mailbox. Um, or you can take a look and, and see all the messages that match a particular rule. If you're doing legal hold, you have an E3 license, you can search all your mailboxes for certain kinds of content or for an email with a certain subject or email sent to or from a certain person in a certain date range. You can also run reports to see who has accessed other people's mailboxes. Right? So um, maybe you have given someone permission to access someone's mailbox, but you want to know what they did in that person's mailbox. You can actually go Becky, uh, is there, are there any questions about anything we talked about? Um, yeah, we did actually get a couple of questions in. Uh, Sue just asked, is there any limit for retention, like how many years or anything like that? Uh, there is no limit for retention. There's an unlimited retention. Okay, great. And then regarding uh, the Azure video, we had a question that came in just as you were moving on asking, uh, or saying, you said Flash-based will change to what? And kind of following up on that, with use of Macs, are there any browser issues with Flash or with whatever it will change to? Uh, sure. So it does, right now it uses Flash, um, but it will uh, be moving to sort of an HTML5 standard player that, that just runs on JavaScript and doesn't require any plugins. Great. And, and uh, we have a couple Flash of does work on Macs right now. Okay. Great. We have a couple of other questions that are in here, but not specifically about what you've covered with compliance and retention. So if you want to move forward, we can go ahead and do that, and I'll save those for toward the end. Sounds good. Great. Thanks. 
Okay. So let's talk about some of these compliance tools in SharePoint. Um, so um, again, I want to mention um, in SharePoint we also have access to run audit reports to see what's been changed, what's been modified, what's been deleted inside of SharePoint Online. So if you have a file that is deleted or a file that's modified and you want to know who made that change, we can actually run, um, we can actually do reporting and we can run reports inside of Office 365. Um, this does have to be enabled for OneDrive, but is enabled by default inside of SharePoint Online. Um, another tool that is available now is uh, data loss prevention. This is uh, coming soon, so it hasn't been entirely announced. We don't know exactly what's included, and we don't know what kind of license it's going to require. It will probably require an E3 license. Um, but basically, right now, inside of SharePoint Online and OneDrive, you can search for files that might vo violate certain policies. So you can look for files that have a social security number in them, or you can look for files that have credit card information in them. You can flag those files so that you know that people are storing stuff in SharePoint Online or in OneDrive that shouldn't be there. It should be in your database or in QuickBooks or something like that. Right? Um, and when users try, um, so, so that's, that's sort of included right now. You can do that. Um, and that does not require an E3 license. But moving in the future, we're going to have some additional functionality. So we'll actually be able to display warnings to users. So if users try to save a, um, a Word document that matches you know, your, case, your case notes template somewhere other than the document library in SharePoint that's specifically designed to store your case notes, it can prevent them from saving that template into Office 365 or OneNote and let them know that they need to store it in this other location. Or if they have a file with a social security number and they're trying to save that to SharePoint, it can um, automatically encrypt that document or it can prevent them from saving it at all. So these are tools that are becoming available in SharePoint Online. And if you take a look in that roadmap uh, website, you will, see, um, you will see all that information. Another tool that is available right now is file-based encryption inside of SharePoint Online. This does require an E3 license. Uh, when you do this, you can set up encryption in a document library, and you can automatically encrypt the files that are in that document library. And when you do that and you open up the file in Word or in Excel or in OneNote, Word or Excel or OneNote actually checks the username and password that you logged into that application with, and it asks Office 365 for the encryption key to decrypt that document. And if Office 365 you know, says that you don't have access to access that document, if you don't have permissions to access that document, it won't release the encryption key and the document will not be able to be opened. Okay? So this is um, true file-based encryption. So no matter where the file is, that file cannot be opened unless you have access to it. You can invite other people and it can actually encrypt the, the file with a Windows Live account. So no matter where it is, if it's on your computer, if it's in SharePoint, if you've emailed it outside of your organization, if you don't have access to that file, you won't be able to edit it. You can also do things like make the file visible but not printable or editable, but still allow people to open it and read it. And that is built into the encryption as well. And Word and Excel and PowerPoint will respect that. There are some drawbacks. There are some performance drawbacks right, of encrypting files. Um, and also, you can't edit encrypted files in the web app. So you can view them, but you can't edit them. If you want to edit them, you have to download them to your computer. Um, and that's it for compliance tools in SharePoint Online. Um, hey, Sam? It for, yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Sam, you want to talk a little bit about the Microsoft Trust? You want to talk a little bit about the Microsoft Trust Center and compliance with HIPAA and business associates or business agreements and all that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Becky, do we have any questions about, um, about anything we've talked about? Um, and then I can go on and speak a little bit to that. Sure. Well, we have gotten a handful of questions about HIPAA compliance, specifically since we're talking about compliance on this. But um, for the ones that you mentioned uh, specifically, Let's see. You know, most of so James had a question saying, uh, "Are there compliance features for files that violate policy? Can that be enforced and used also for OneDrive? So, can you use some of this compliance stuff in OneDrive as well?" Yeah. So the compliance stuff works in OneDrive or SharePoint Online. Right now, it's limited to searching for documents that violate policies. 
but in the near future, the next release is going to include functionality to prevent people from saving things places that they shouldn't be able to save them, and doing things like uh, notify managers if they try to do so, uh, so that you do have some kind of feedback trail on what's going on. Gotcha. I think that's the only thing uh, that was specifically compliance related, but we have gotten, like I said, a couple of questions about HIPAA and whether Office 365 complies with HIPAA and um, whether Microsoft will sign you know, compliance agreement, those kind of things. So uh, if you have any thoughts on that, that would be helpful for the folks that are concerned with that specifically. Great. Um, I have um, lots of thoughts and zero um, lawyerly credentials. So um, I'm going to try and answer it, but obviously talk to your lawyers, um, and I'm sure someone's going to say that you know what I'm saying is wrong, but hopefully I get pretty close. Uh, so uh, most of HIPAA and PCI and these things have more to do about your policies and procedures and how you use the information than about the technology that you're actually using. So Office 365 can be HIPAA compliant, and Microsoft will sign what's called a business associates agreement that says that yes, you know, we are able to be HIPAA compliant. You know, we have the controls in place to make sure that our employees can't access you know, data that they shouldn't be accessing. We have um, you know, security in place to be monitoring for external threats. Right? We have the physical security to say, yes, people can't enter our data centers and access our servers you know, w without our knowledge. So that is all something that is included in that HIPAA agreement that Microsoft will sign. Um, and you know they uh, you know they can also store you know other kinds of sensitive data inside of the Microsoft Cloud. Um, you can actually request a like a personalized signed HIPAA agreement just for your organization from Microsoft, which is certainly something that is unusual um, with a lot of these players. Now, just because you're in Office 365 does not mean that you are HIPAA compliant. My understanding. And this is where we, we step a little bit into the uncharted here. But my understanding is that you know, as long as you have policies and procedures that say you cannot store information inside of SharePoint Online um, you know, that has a social security number, that has to go into our case management system. Um, or you know, this data has to go in this place because only certain people have access to that. And you have policies and you're doing training and you're enforcing those policies. You, know, you are in line with the HIPAA regulations. But what a lot of these tools do is they help you take it a step further and make sure that people are actually following those policies and procedures rather than having them be sort of best effort and you know, publishing the policies and, and trying to enforce them. They're actually required because the tools themselves enforce them, um, which is good because, um, well, you're still on the hook if your personal information gets lost. So you know, if you lose a spreadsheet that has all of your client's social security numbers on it, you're on the hook for notifying all of those people about the data breach and for providing credit monitoring and all the fun stuff that you have to do in that situation. And so what a lot of these tools can do, like the file-based encryption um, and, the, um, you know, and preventing people from saving that stuff in SharePoint is to minimize the chances of something happening with that. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Linda, did I cover what you were hoping I would cover there? Yes, and I chatted out the Microsoft Trust Center, please. Oh, great. Yeah, and so the Microsoft Trust Center is a great place to go to get any information about Office 365. Um, it really is, you know, if you're getting questions from your board or from your, you know, your counsel or from your accountant, send them to the Microsoft Trust Center. It's pretty overwhelmingly impressive about all the credentials and the certifications, and there's all these security white papers that talk about, you know, the physical and the, you know, the personnel uh, levels of security. Um, it really you know, they, they do a good job with that. Great. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, we've had a handful of folks on the back end asking questions about, you know, issues they've had. One person is using Google Apps for email and, and document sharing, and they've had some trouble with security. And I think what you just commented about that, you know, you need to have the policies in place and help your staff understand how to use them because no matter, you know, if you have weak passwords, if you have, um, people who open emails or send emails that they shouldn't be sending, that undermines any kind of agreement or compliance you might be trying to work towards, regardless of whether the software is technically compliant. User behavior is often the thing that will undermine anything that you're using, whether it's Google Apps or Office 365 or installed programs. So making sure that your, your staff, your users, your students, whoever they may be, are aware of kind of you know, the smart behaviors to keep things secure as well. 
Um, we don't have any other questions that are specific to compliance, but we do have a bunch of other questions. And I think unless there's anything else you want to wrap up with here, I think we're at the point where we can start Q&A officially. Um, did you have anything else to add before we move to that? No, sounds good. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and pop this open and let people know that they can continue to ask questions also in our Office 365 for Nonprofits forum thread after this event as well. But I'll go ahead and start asking some questions that came in more generally. Um, Kathy asks, can you have a group shared calendar in Office 365 where you can see everybody's calendars on one page? Uh, where is that set up in Office 365? How does that work? Sure, you can do it in a few different ways. You can add up to – so inside of Outlook itself, you can actually overlay multiple people's calendars, and you can show them all one on top of another um, in a number of different views, either a calendar view or sort of like a timeline view so you can easily find um, appointments. You can also add a special web part to a SharePoint site where you can view up to 10 people's calendars at once inside of SharePoint on a web page. Um, so it is certainly possible. You can also view multiple people's calendars with the, um, with the Outlook app for iOS and Android. Great. So a variety of ways to do that. Um, we also had a question about storage. How much storage do you get with Office 365? And they're comparing with what they currently have with Google Apps to see if one might be better than the other for their needs. Sure. So uh, storage with email with an E1 license is 50 gigabytes. So you get 50 gigabytes of storage for every mailbox. Each individual mailbox gets that amount. The E3 license comes with unlimited email storage. So there is no limit in the amount of email that you can have. Um, with uh, SharePoint Online, um, you now get 100 gigabytes of storage for your organization, plus 500 megabytes for each user. So if you have 10 users, that's 5 gigabytes plus 100 gigabytes, that's 105 gigabytes of storage for your sort of shared content, so for shared documents, for um, you know, stuff that pe multiple people are using. OneDrive actually is unlimited. So each user gets an unlimited OneDrive um, account. So they can store as much as they want in that OneDrive. But again, that's not for sharing. So that's, uh, that sort of replaces a personal My Documents folder. Great. Uh, we also had a question asking, um, where did it go? It just moved up on my screen. Um, does SharePoint 365 have a help desk feature? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, you do get support with Office 365. That's included, both phone and, uh, and email support. Um, as far as tracking help desk operations, ticketing, that sort of thing, you certainly could build something in SharePoint that would do that, um, but it is not something that's sort of built in or comes with the product. Yes, that's great to know. And there are lots of programs out there that can act as a ticketing system if you need something for your own help desk tickets. Um, let's see, we also have a question asking, uh, is there a way to share contact groups with multiple users in Outlook? Uh, sure, you can, create, um, you can create distribution groups inside of the administrative control panel and you can add external people to those distribution groups so that multiple people can access them. That's probably the best way to manage it. You can also share a contact list which can include distribution groups, uh, but you do need the Outlook client to access that. So you can't access shared contact lists with Outlook Web Access or with the, uh, with the mobile client. Great. Um, let's see, we have how many accounts can you make in one year? So I'm assuming that's how, is there a limit to the number of Office 365 no, accounts no you can create? I've talked to nonprofits that have created 30,000 um, accounts okay. inside of Office 365. Great. And Jeremiah who asked that question, if you were asking about some other kind of account, let us know in the chat and I can clarify that question more. Um, let's see, we also have a question about attachment limits for sending emails in Exchange 365, uh, referencing that it was 4 megabytes before. Is there still an attachment limit, like to the size of an attachment you can send through Office 365 email? Sure. So um, as long as I've known, it was 25 megabytes. Uh, at least as long as I've been tracking. Maybe that's relatively recent, but they did just recently increase it to 150 megabytes, um, although uh, you do need to manually uh, update and tell off. The default is still 25. Um, but you know, I would point out that very few external email servers are going to accept attachments that are bigger than 125 megabytes or even as big as 100, 150 megabytes. Excuse me. So um, you know, use, that, use that feature with care. Great. And uh, Andrea comments, just as 
for folks who are wondering that Google is still limiting at 25 megabytes comparatively. So it looks like Office 365 has expanded well beyond that at this point, which is great. Yeah, um, I would like to point out you shouldn't be sending 150 megabyte attachments. You should be storing that stuff <laughs> in SharePoint and sharing it out from there. Exactly. Send people a link to where they can find it. And let them exactly. Uh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's definitely good practice. Uh, we had a question asking about how difficult is it to enable public folders, so to make something fold, a folder public. Is that just a simple setting? Um, I'm going to assume thing? that this relates to the, the Exchange public folders, um, which are a feature that Microsoft did recently realize that they couldn't kill off in Office 365. They tried for a little bit and they brought it back. Um, and it's pretty easy. Inside of the Exchange Control Panel, there's actually a whole tab, the, the, online, the Exchange Online Control Panel for public folders. And you create a public folder mailbox. And then you create a public folder under that, and you would make yourself the owner of it. And then inside of Outlook, um, you would create subfolders that are storing calendar appointments or mail appointments or contacts or whatever that is. Um, and then you would um, be able to mail enable that. You go back to the Office 365 web interface and mail enable them. So it's a little bit convoluted, but it does work. Um, you can access mail public folders and calendar public folders from Office 365 Outlook Web Access, um, but um, anything else you can only access from Outlook itself. Great. That's helpful even if a little bit uh, clunky to get you <laughs> from the sound of it. Um, let's see. James asks, uh, with OneDrive granting my users one terabyte of personal storage, what about business storage? Is that separate from the one terabyte? OneDrive and OneDrive for Business are totally separate things. They're not at all related, um, even though they share a name. So, um, so each user would get OneDrive, would get OneDrive for Business, and they would get um, right now. At some for some people it's one terabyte, for some people it's unlimited. It's going unlimited for everyone. So they would get unlimited storage inside of OneDrive, and and that's designed to store their business documents, like their My Documents folder. It's not something. I mean, you can make a decision for your organization whether or not you want to let them store their music and their pictures in there. But it is, it is designed to be all business storage. So that, that, is, that is shared with your OneDrive for Business account. They could have a separate gotcha. OneDrive account, which is you know, a consumer product and separate. Right. So you could, and you can also have a policy, like you mentioned, about whether you allow staff to store music or stream videos or save things like that, personal right. items. I promise that um, they would follow that policy. You know, to the left. <laughs> right, that's what I was going to say. You can have a policy, but whether they actually follow it is a totally different story. Um, so it's good to, good to consider before uh, moving into that. Um, let's see. We had a follow-up question from John about the public folders, asking would he be able to import his data from his current public folders? Yep, or would he have to start a new? The easiest way to do it is export to a PST and then import again. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, we have what's the best way to share a calendar of meetings to multiple outside users that may be using various mail and calendar clients? Uh, is there a way to publish the calendar or share it via email? Yeah, you can publish the calendar um, in like a, a standard format that other people can access. That's a pretty new feature. You can access that from Outlook. Um, it will probably oh, require um, Outlook 2013. I've never tried in Outlook 2010. Great. So, if you're in your admin compliance section and jumping back to that, you know, whether your staff can store videos and, and their personal photos, can you use the admin compliance things to limit people from doing that? Um, you could. So right now what you could do is you could look for files that have sort of video extensions and then yell at people for that. Um, in the future you will be able to prevent them from saving that stuff to OneDrive. Well, probably. I'm not actually. They haven't released all the features yet, so I know that you know when you're working in one of the office applications, it will check the content to determine whether or not it's allowed. I don't know if you will be able to do that with other file extensions. So right, and I guess if you're limiting out, file uh, extensions, yeah. I mean, if you're able to limit the file extensions, that would potentially limit staff who maybe are taking legitimate work-related videos for you from being able to save them as well. So. Some things to consider there before locking things down necessarily. Yep, uh, let's see. We have another question just asking. Uh, OneDrive used to have a limit of 20,000 files at one time. Is that still the limit? It is still the limit. Yep. Um, and so okay. uh, right now they are working on rewriting the whole Think Client. It's going to be combined OneDrive and OneDrive for Business Think Client. It should work a lot better, and that's going to do away with that limit and also enable Selective Sync, um, and that will be coming this year. 
Well, terrific. So I'm going to go ahead and there's the last couple of minutes here. We've answered most of the questions and still a few in the back end that we're working to answer. Uh, Linda chatted out Sam's contact info as well as hers so we can continue to follow up with them directly. And also, like I mentioned, uh, the link on this page, I'll be sure to um, include this link down here at the bottom to our Office 365 for Nonprofits forum thread where you can continue to ask additional questions. Really quickly, I just wanted to show where you can get additional tech impact support so from folks like Sam and Linda directly. But we have a couple of offers in our catalog. Again, there's a link to Office 365 for nonprofits that you can get directly through Microsoft. If you are trying to decide if this is the right fit for you, Tech Impact offers a $10 admin fee, Office 365 assessment where they'll talk to you about your organization's specific needs and goals and where your data is, how much staff you have, sort of what your situation is with tech support uh, on board at the moment, and help guide you as to whether it is the right fit for your needs. And then they also have a series of workshops. So if you are trying to migrate your organization over, they have workshops for smaller organizations with fewer than 20 employees and larger organizations. And they also have a workshop series a do-it-yourselfer workshop series on migrating SharePoint. And these are available through our catalog. It's a great discount, $300 admin fee for the series of trainings that will walk you through step-by-step -step how to do those things. So I just wanted to highlight that quickly. And again, you can find these just by searching on the TechSoup.org website. If you just search Office 365, these options pop up. You can also search under Tech Impact as a donor partner on our site, and the, the various offers that they have in our catalog will show up too. So again, I've got links to each of these. They also have a one-hour one consultation that they offer with a tech advisor like Sam or Linda to talk to you about the different options um, and tech needs that you may have. If you need one-on-one -on -one support and advice, they're there to give it to you. And again, they're a nonprofit, so they're hoping to support you in making the best decision for your organization's needs. Here are some additional resources. Uh, this will be included in the slide deck. Many of you have already received this slide deck on the right side of that final reminder email. So if you want to dive right in, you can look at these links. This is the link to the product page uh, where you can get Office 365. This is that webinar I referenced from a couple of weeks ago. That's more of a beginner walkthrough of what's included with Office 365, how to get it, how the licensing works in more detail, um, and then lots of other resources that we have here, um, whether it's right for your organization, whether um, other webinars that we've done, uh, an overview of how to do it yourself if that's how you're looking to go. And that was also done with Sam and is a higher level overview of what things you need to consider if you're going to migrate to Office 365 on your own. Um, lots of resources that I would recommend checking out if you're moving in that direction and need some additional support. I'd love it if you could chat into us to let us know what one thing you learned today that you're going to be taking back with you to uh, implement or try out or check out at your organization. And I'd love it if you would let us know if you'll plan to share this resource with your friends and colleagues who could benefit from it too. We hope that you will. And uh, share it with anybody who may need more information about Office 365. Lastly, I'd like to invite you to join us for any upcoming webinars and events. We have an NP Tech Chat coming up on Tuesday. This will be on Twitter, just following that hashtag. NP Tech Chat where we'll be talking about how data is fueling social change. So if you are into data, data, big data, data scientists, that's a great conversation to join Tuesday. And then we will be doing a webinar on July 9th on using Google AdWords grants to drive impact for your nonprofit and get that donation for your social uh, media marketing and engine marketing. We'll be doing a crash course with Adobe on their Creative Cloud product. And then we'll be talking about nonprofit payment processing and credit card processing options for nonprofits later on in July. So feel free to join us for any of those events. Thank you so much to Sam and Linda for your expertise today. We really appreciate hearing from you. Thank you to Kevin for helping on the back end. Please join us again at TechSoupGlobal.org, at TechSoup.org, and on our Facebook and Twitter channels. And lastly, I'd like to thank ReadyTalk for the use of their platform, sponsoring today's webinar by providing it for us to use on a weekly basis. Uh, you can learn more about their donation of ReadyTalk in this webinar platform at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk if you are looking for a tool like this to use for your own events. When you close out of the window, please complete, complete the post-event survey to help us continue to improve our webinar programming. really appreciate you all joining us today. 
Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.